Parshas Lecha, page 54. So, uh, the Torah says like this, Vayomer Hashem ala Avram, Lech lecha me'artzucho, Umimoladetucho me'beis avicha, Elo eretz asher areka. Go from your land and your birthplace and your father's house to, to your father's household to the uh, land which I will show you. So uh, right here you have the first command, the first statement in the Torah, the first time we find a communication to Avram Avino. This is the first time the Torah says, uh, says anything to Avram Avino, that God talks to Avram Avino. It's the first time that, 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 that the Torah says anything to Avram, to, that Hashem communicates with Avram Avino, page, four, page 54. Page 54. And uh, um, the, uh, it's the first command that he gets, which is go traveling. Okay? Now, the first thing we want to understand is what's the difficulty here? This is considered one of the tests for Avram Avino. Now, what's the difficulty over here? Go, start traveling. Where? I'll show you. So, there's a rule in life, there's a rule in life that, uh, uh, you know, imagine I would say to you the following. I say, uh, you know, I want you to, um, I'm going to give you a ticket. I want you to go down to the airport. And when you get to the airport, I'm going to give you a ride. You get a limousine ride to the airport. And waiting for you in the airport is going to be a ticket, a first-class plane flight on an LL flight. Where are you going? I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Get on the plane. I'll let you know. So you get on the plane, and you find out you're going to Spain. And where am I, what am I going to do in Spain? Uh, when, I, when I get to Spain, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you know in Spain where you're going. Here's a connecting flight. All first class, all kosher meals. First class kosher meals, okay? And when you get to Spain, you find out you're flying to Kansas City. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And what am I doing in Kansas City? Well, there's going to be a, a special hotel accommodations for you. Five-star hotel, kosher meals. Then you're going back to the airport the next day and you're flying. Where to? You'll find out. Then you get on the plane and you find out that you're flying to England. And the same thing happens. And for me, and I don't tell you where you're going. You know, how, how long do you think you could handle that for? I mean, first class was good. Class? Yeah. How do you think you could handle that for? Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, now you're not in first class. Now you're in the middle seat on a, on a transatlantic flight. No, they, 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 that not. They, they can't handle. With no kosher meals. You make your own food. Bring your own food along. All of a sudden, it, it, it's, it's not quite as tempting, is it? Whatever that is, it was more difficult for Alvaro Vito. Pack your bags and start traveling through the, the ancient roads, deserts, with highwaymen, bandits, everybody else is around you. Start traveling. Where am I going? Uh, I'll let you know. All right? So you pick up and you pack and you go. You understand the difficulty of the test? That's the test. Yeah. I don't even know where I'm going. I'm going to travel, number one. Number two, number two uh, um, if you ever remember when you were a kid, anytime you've traveled anywhere, even as an adult, when you first go somewhere, it always takes, it's always shorter on the way back than when you're on the way there. Because on the way there, you don't know where you're going. It's interminable. You don't know how, when is this going to end. Anything that you don't know when it's going to end, yeah. psychologically, is more difficult, even if it's the exact same, even if it's the exact same time 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 limit. There's actually a halacha. It's a very interesting halacha, uh, and it goes to something that the Torah itself says. The Torah says that the Jewish people in Egypt were at hard labor. Avodas perach. Now, thank you very much. Avodas perach uh, literally means uh, a, a harsh. Harsh labor. Now, what was that harsh labor that the Jewish people were for? So, one opinion is, you know, you're building the pyramids and they're whipping you and everything is everything is difficult, so on and so forth, which is true. But there's an opinion of the Gemara that the harsh labor was that they, they, they were, first of all, they were building the pyramids and they were sink, sinking into the ground. Did you ever hear that idea? They're building the pyramids, they're sinking into the ground. Now, let me ask you a question. If I would pay you, I'll pay you 50 bucks an hour to build. Build. You were on a, on a, on a, on a construction crew. And at the end of every day, I come over and I wreck the thing that you built. Then the next day, I tell you, I'll pay you 50 bucks an hour build. And then at the end of the day, I wreck it. How long would you be able to do that for? Hey, you could do it for a while. You know, you could use some pocket. No, I could do it for a couple of weeks, I think. I could handle that. You know, I need to, after a while, you're going to start, it's going to get edgy. You know, what, what's the point of this? This is, this is pointless. Isn't there, there's a, there's a story I once heard in, in, in full, uh, some philosophical story about some, some guy, probably a Greek guy, because they, they always, you know, if, if you don't know, just say he's Greek. There's some Greek, some Greek guy who's in prison for 20 years, and for 20 years they got him chained to a, to a wheel, and he's got to push the wheel. The wheel is on the other side of the prison wall, which you can't see it. And for 20 years he's grinding and grinding and grinding and grinding all day, every day, he's a hard labor. And finally, they come and he's released. And before anything, before he has a steak and french fries, before he eats a good meal, before he takes a shower, before anything, he runs to the other side of the wall to see what he's been grinding for 20 years. And it turns out there was nothing there. So he drops dead on the spot. 
Uh, because he couldn't take uh, some, some philosophical story like that. They, that's a, they, they use that as a example. person needs to feel you're doing something. And when you're not doing something, A, if you're not accomplishing, you, you, it, it eats away at you. B, avodas perach, there's another point. Now pay attention carefully because you're going to need this one day and you will, you will remember that I told you and then you will make out the checks to Kaplan with a K, right? Avodas perach, the Gemara says, is role reversal. The men did the women's jobs and the women did the men's jobs. In life, the most frustrating thing in life is to be given an assignment to do something that you are inadequate at. I'm not good at it. I'm just not. I could do hard work and I could work for a long time. But don't get. Don't tell me to go and fix electronic equipment in the house. I can't do it. And if I do it, I'm always worried it's not going to work. After all, time I. How come I ended up with with one extra screw over here? I guess we don't need that one. You know, I'll throw it away. Then you plug it in. Boom, you just knocked out the electric system of the whole city. Right? I guess you did need that screw. You know, you just said, I'm not good at it. Don't get, I can't do that job. And when I have to do that job, I'm nervous and tense. Now, for a woman to do hard labor, she's totally inadequate for that job. Most women anyway. And yeah, most women anyway are, are totally, totally, women truck drivers, something else. But, but most women are totally inadequate to do that job. Take a man and put him in the house with children. Now, you love your children, love them to pieces, right? But men and women have a different clock. Women are, do not have time-bound mitzvahs. You know why? Because they don't have an, the same type of internal clock men do. Men have, you have to be up, you have to say, Zaman Kriya Shema, Tefillin, Shimon Esra, you gotta be at work, you gotta be, a woman has one job, she's domestic. And domestics are not on a clock. You can't have a, well, sorry, you know, little, little shimmy is screaming away in his crib, he's three months old, the mother says, sorry, I can't pick you up now, I have to daven Shimon Esra. It doesn't work that way. You do not have time limitations, because your job, more than that, when I've had to stay home and take care of the kids, my absolute pleasure, right? What happens is, you know, you start up, you change a diaper, you start making a sandwich, then you got to go break up a fight, continue making a sandwich, change another diaper, uh, uh, prepare another sandwich, go to turn up, run, and then, you know, break up another fight, then somebody's crying, somebody, somebody needs to kiss their boo boo, and that's the first 10 minutes. That's the first time, and nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. You're taking care of a taking care of a two year old or a one and a half year old, and you know, you talk to them and you play. But it's not like you see, okay, and all of a sudden, you know, I talked to him for 20 minutes, now he knows all about Bakama. It doesn't work that way. There's no instant gratification that a man normally has. He accomplished a task. A woman is a nurturer. So to put a man in that position is called avodas perach. I don't see any time. There's nothing, there's no limit to the time. Do you understand? There's a different, a very fundamental difference in the male, male, female nature. That's why stereotypically the women are always late. <coughs> women don't have a clock. And even in television, they always have the husband's waiting and the wife shows up late because she doesn't pay attention to a clock because she's not attuned to a clock because her job doesn't lend to being attuned to a clock. You understand it? That is a rule. There's nothing we can do. That's how we were created. Now, take a man. The, the, the Torah says, let's say you own a slave. You're not allowed to tell a slave, start digging under the tree. And well, how long for? Well, I'll let you know later. Can't do that. That's a vodas perach. Can't tell somebody start working. All I do. That's a vodas perach. It's not fair. He doesn't know when the end is. Do you know that when you learn with your children, so parents, parents, you know, later on, you have families, you want to learn with your child. Never sit down with a child and say to the child, okay, let's learn. Without giving a time limit. If you don't give a time limit, the kid won't hear a word you're saying. Because the child wants to know when is this going to end. You say to your child, let's learn for 20 minutes. And then when you hit about 17 minutes, say to him, well, you learned so well, you know what, we're going to stop early. And I can almost guarantee you he'll say to you, no, no, let's continue. And if you do it the other way, kid won't hear a word you say. Because a child, you know, when the Gemara wants to use an example of, of, of an example of people running away from somewhere. People were just running away. You know what the example the Gemara uses? Like a child running away from school. Did you ever see what happened? The most, one of the most dangerous places to ever stand is right in front of a schoolyard when the bell rings at the end of the day. You get trampled because the kids are running away from school. Kids don't like to be in school in any religion, in any, in any, in any language, in any culture. And they're going to be run away from school. So the Gwar is telling you, the, 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 the Torah is telling you, you know what kind of test this is? This test is an insight into human nature. This is a very, very fundamental insight into human nature. The difficulty of a test is not knowing where, where is this all going? Where is it heading? Right there is the difficulty of a test. And that's the first test to Avravita. The first communication to Avravita is pack your bags and get going. Where? 
I'll let you know. You understand the difficulty of test? And it's not first class, but I want to tell you something. Even if it was first class, you still, after a while, would be able to take it. Because at a certain point, you'd say to yourself, but what am I doing? That's human nature. Where, where am I going with all this? That, that is the, 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 the dif difficulty number one. That's called avodas perach. Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz itself was the Rosh Yeshiva, the Mir Yeshiva. So the Mir Yeshiva, you got the greatest scholars, and the greatest scholars are in this year, and everything else. And at the end of the day, Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz never ended a shear a minute late. You can't go beyond the time limit of a shear. As eager as people are to go and learn Torah and, and hear Torah, they're also eager to leave. And it's not fair to keep people even a minute longer, longer than they are. That's the, that's the rule. That's what the Torah teaches you. That's number one. Number two, um, th there, did you ever hear the concept of Maisa Ovos Simen Lebanim? Does anybody know what that concept means? Maisa Ovos Simen Lebanim. The actions of the forefathers are a, are, are a uh, what's the word, a, a, a prelude or a, uh, a precursor of what, oh, good word a precursor of what's going to happen to the children in future generations. Whatever the far, Avram Avinu went down to Egypt, and Claude, the, the children, the Jewish people, ended up going down to Egypt, and so on and so forth. Everything that they ever did becomes a precursor for what's going to happen to the children. That's called Maisa Ovos Simen Lebanon. What happened to the forefathers is going to happen to the children. Now, look at the first thing God says to Avram Avinu. Lech lecha, go. That right there is the first words. It's a description of Jewish history, isn't it? It's the scripture of Jewish history. What have we been doing our entire, for the last couple thousand years? We're wandering. You're not traveling. Not traveling. We're wandering. Travel is when, you know, you make plans, you take brochures, and you see where you go, and then it's never as good as you thought. But wandering is because, or wandering, fleeing, running, trying to find survival. That's what we've been doing. That's not traveling. Traveling is when you go, <laughs> that's travel. All right, wandering is, oh boy, you know, the church is after us, so we're being thrown out of Spain, let's wander. And we don't even know where we're wandering. The wandering is when you leave Europe or the United States or, 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 or the British won't let you get to Palestine. That's wandering. Traveling is when you decide where you're going. We've been wandering. Lech lecha. Start wandering. Where? You don't know where. That's Gullus. That's a Misa of a similar. That's a precursor. Excuse me. That's a precursor to what's going to be happening in Jewish history. Number one. Number two, do you know that Rabbi Yaakov, you heard of Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky? Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky was one of the Gedolei Hador. Uh, contemporary Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Aaron Kalt, Rabbi Yaakov Kabanetsky said, you know, right here 15 minutes away, you've got the Temple Mount. And on the Temple Mount, there's a golden dome. Now, I had a friend in high school who was a very deep guy, and he said he can't wait for Mashiach to come. He, was, he wanted Mashiach to come. Why? Because he wanted to see the dome blown up. Right, he couldn't wait to see all that gold explode up into the air. That's what he said. He was a very, very deep, for, deep person. <laughs> uh, so, so Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky said, you know, in all the picture postcards of Yerushalayim, always show you the dome. And you take a look at the postcard and say, wow, that's really beautiful. Uh, oh, ooh, one second. That's a, that, 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 that's a mosque on our Temple Mount. You know, you got to get, because it really is a very impressive sight. Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky said, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You know why? Why do you think? It's a reminder. We're not home. We're not in Gullus. We're not. We're very much in exile still. If there's a temple, if there's a mosque on the temple, without a mosque on the temple mount, you could easily be deceived. Like, okay, we're here. Now we're in Israel. We could eat falafel and say, yalla, bye. All right, and we're ready. We're just ready. We're, we're at such a spiritual level. No, you're not on a spiritual level at all. We're eating falafel and saying, yalla, bye, which tells you what kind of spiritual level we are. And, 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 and we have a long, long way to go. The dome is a reminder. You're, on, you're, 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 in a, you're far from home. And that's why there's an interesting phenomenon. Rabbi Gifter, that's always Rosh Yeshiva, that tells Yeshiva, isn't it an interesting phenomenon? Every Jewish city you ever go to, I can't believe there isn't a Jewish city that this applies to. Every Jewish city you ever go to, you will always see the old Jewish neighborhood. Right? The old Jewish neighborhood means there's a new Jewish neighborhood. Well, why didn't you just stay in the old Jewish neighborhood? There's an old, in Chicago, there isn't an old Irish neighborhood. There's only one Irish neighborhood. They've been living there a long time. There's one German neighborhood in Chicago. They've been living there a long time. But there's a new Jewish neighborhood. The Jewish neighborhood keeps moving forward. In London, there's where the Jews used to live on the, on the, on, on the east end, right? Now, now they're on the west end. That's in the north end, south end. Why are Jews always moving around? Because undesirables of any nationality, whatever, however undesirable they are, move into Jewish neighborhoods, and the Jewish neighborhoods start moving. That's how Kodesh Baruch way of keeping us on the move. No matter how complacent and how comfortable you become in Gullus, in Chutzlarts, or anywhere, 
no matter how complacent you become, Kodesh Baruch says, you know what, time to move. Chicago, it used to be on the south side, on the west side, you know, on the, on the other side. Now, these are places that nobody would go uh, unless you have an armed escort. And then you go up to the north side. Even the north side now is shifting north, further north in Chicago. Because HaKodesh Baruch says, you know what, you've gotten, you're, you're gotten very comfortable here. There are people who build giant homes in, in, in Golos. They build comfortable homes. they got a swimming pool and they got a, a, an indoor gymnasium and everything Okay, of course, well, it's time to move. Okay, number two. Number three, a very interesting question. I, by the way, the word lech lecha, the word lech lecha, comes from the Hebrew word lichluch. Very much right. The word dirt in Hebrew is lichluch. Lamid chaf, lamid chaf. Exact same letters. Lichluch. So the commentaries say that the word lech lecha is also a way of saying to Abraham, you know, get up. This is Jewish destiny, Jewish history as well. Get away from the dirt of your surroundings. Lech lecha. A Jew always has to try to avoid, has to try to get away from the dirt of his surroundings. If you don't get away from the dirt of your surroundings, then you will be sucked in to the dirt of your surroundings. There was actually a big rabbi in Israel named Rabbi Shalom Shvadron. You guys ever heard of Rabbi Shalom Shvadron? The Magid, the famous Magid. Rabbi Shalom Shvadron was once walking. Yeah, I think I mentioned this before, Rosh Hashanah. He was once walking here in Yerushalayim. And he, years ago, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, and uh, Rabbi Shalom Shadron was walking, and he, as he was walking, he smelled a terrible smell. And he had to go in that direction, and the closer, the more, the further he walked, the stronger the stench became. He kept walking, kept walking, and all of a sudden he sees there's a city cesspool, an open city cesspool. And he looks into the cesspool, he sees there's a burst pipe, and sewage is pouring out into the cesspool. There are three Arab city workers are sitting in the uh, are sitting in the are in the cesspool. They got these big wrenches, you know, and they're you know, they're trying to fix this 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 the sewage pipe where where the, where where the sewage is pouring out. And Rabbi Shradron stopped there. It's always fascinating to watch other people working while you're not. And you know, he's just watching these guys sitting there working in there. He's watching them for about five minutes, ten minutes. They're sitting there trying to close the cesspool. The sewage is spilling out. And at a certain point, one of them says something to the other one in Arabic. The other one grunts, he, he does like that. The three of them go off, they sit off to the side, they pull out a paper bag, they reach in, they pull out some hummus and pita, a couple of Cokes, you know, with sitting there with it. And right there in the cesspool, they sit down and they have lunch. He said he was positively nauseated. He says they're sitting in the muck, in the cesspool, they're sitting there right on the side and they're eating their lunch. So Shodron said, learn an important lesson. Learn an important lesson. In life, you can get used to anything. You could be in a cesspool, and you could get used to it, you get accustomed to it. Do you ever wonder, how does a guy work in a fish shop? You ever go out at the fish store? Right? Fish, you know, it's got that fishy smell, they think, how can you, why aren't you working in there? You know, people say, I would work in a bakery before a fish shop, fish store. You probably don't need to notice either, once you've been working there for a while. You don't notice it, that's what you do. You work in a fish store, you work in the bakery. Okay, I'd rather work in, I'd still rather work in a bakery if I had to choose. But at the end of the day, you get used to it. That's, a, that, that's what you get accustomed to. Our society, obviously, we lived last year, last week's Parsha, was Noah, right? God wipes out the generation of flood. Now, I want to show you something very interesting. Turn back for a second. Turn back to the beginning of Parsha's Noah, page 30. Why did God have to wipe them out? I mean, couldn't you give them a chance, let them do tshuva? Like, oh, somebody help them out. Okay, he does give them a chance, but they don't do tshuva. Why didn't they do tshuva? The key to the entire Parsha is in Pasuk, page 30, Pasuk Yud Aleph and Pasuk Yud Beis. This is the key to the entire Parsha. It says, The land became corrupted before God. And it became filled with violence. Look at the very next Pasuk. God saw the land became corrupted. The commentary says, Rav Hirsch says, that was the problem. Only God saw it. Only God saw it. Nobody else saw it. You're so drawn in and you are so desensitized to the moral corruption around you, you don't even realize that you're doing anything wrong. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. You don't even realize you shouldn't be doing it. That's HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees that. Only Hashem sees it. If only Hashem sees it. So then there's no chance to do tshuva. So we live in a world that the world draws us in. The world draws us in. We don't know. We're so desensitized. I want to tell you something. There are vocabulary words nowadays that people use on a regular basis. If you used them 20 years ago, people in the room would blush. Nowadays, if you, if you don't use the word, you're called phobic. You're at fault for not 
acknowledging something which the Torah says is an abomination. You're at fault for being allergic to it. That's your problem. You got it to improve. You understand? We all, well, listen, you know, everybody else says it's okay, so I should say it's okay too. That's what the Torah is telling you. I can guarantee you, I can't guarantee you, but I could almost guarantee you, every one of you at some point or other in your life, there was something that you promised yourself at some point, I would never do that. I would never do that. I would never smoke that. I would never snort that. I would never be involved in that. I would never, I would never, I would never uh, swindle like that. And at some point in life, you find yourself doing exactly the thing that you promised a year or two or three or four that, that you would never do. Something. I would never wear something like that. I would never do something. And then one day you find out you are. You know, by me, I remember it was, the first thing was bell-bottom pants. Remember bell-bottoms? Uh. They haven't been, they've been out for a long, long time. And I remember when bell-bottoms first came out, I hated them. Absolutely, I promised us I would never, I was, I think I was in ninth grade or something. I, said, I promised I would never wear bell-bottoms. I think within a, a year, I, I had a big collection. What happened? The, the answer is that we are, our sensitivities are worn down by the society around us. That's why Kodesh Rule says, Lech Lecha, Jew, Jew, get away from the dirt around you. Get away from, you're surrounded by a filthy society in all sorts of ways. Get away from the society, from the society around you. That's uh, idea number two. Idea number three is really a question. And this is, this, is a, this is a tough question. You know, last week's Parsha says that Avram Avinu jumped went into the fire. Now, it doesn't say it in the Torah openly. It's the Medrash. The Medrash says that he was, he, he was given the choice to bow down to the idols or go into, go into the fire at Urkazdim. Okay? Now, that's considered one of the tests, the first of the ten tests. Okay? Now, here comes another test. God says to Avram, travel. So the question becomes like this. The tests culminate with, 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 uh, with, with what do you call it, with the, with the, uh, uh, the Akeda. Where God, where God says to Avram to go in, in Shecht Yitzchak. Right? That's the hardest test. The commentaries say the tests are in an ascending order of difficulty. So let me ask you a question. If given a choice, what would you rather do? Jump into a fire, a furnace, a boiling hot furnace, which the Medrash says was the same furnace that they used in the Tower of Babel, of Babel. Remember they had the Tower of Babel, they built a tower, so they, made, they, made, uh, they used a the furnace to make bricks. A brick-making furnace is a red-hot furnace. That was the furnace that Avram Avinu had to go into. Now, given a choice of going into a brick furnace or traveling without an unknown destination, right? Which would you choose, Yishai? Traveling. Travel. You know, yeah, what, yeah, but you might have to sit in the middle seat. We'll go for it, right? That, that, that will do. I just heard about a guy who was sitting on a plane. And another guy comes walking, a guy comes walking down the aisle where it's about 400 pounds. He comes walking down the aisle of the plane. And he looks at the guy sitting in the seat. He says, do you know who I am? He goes, no. He goes, I'm your worst nightmare. Right? I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> I think they actually have a, they have a law now on airlines. I think that if, if, a, if, a, if a human being is over, is, is, over a certain, uh, is, is over a certain size, then you have to pay for a second seat. You know, it's not fair to, to, to what he costs. So, 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 you know. Yeah, it's difficult to travel, and even with an unknown destination. But I would still, given a choice, I would still uh, uh, prefer that to being thrown into a furnace. So why is the furnace considered the first test, and this is considered a more difficult test? This is an upgraded test. It was, he was so sure that for him, it, it, was, it was obvious. It wasn't even a choice. It was like before they answered that, it was good and bad. It was, he knew it. Excellent, excellent, well, excellent, first. excellent, excellent. One of the commentaries says that the difficulty of the tests, the difficulty of the tests was in the choice. In other words, the more blatant the choice, the less of a test it is. It's not a test. It's just a question of whether or not you'll do it. But you know what you should do. The test involves really, the, it's, like when your wife, it's like when your wife says to you, how do you like the new curtains that I bought? I don't envy you, gentlemen, because I don't know what to say. What am I saying? Oh, well, the safest thing is always, yeah, wow, they're really nice. You know what I'm saying? Not those. Those we've had for six months. I'm talking about those over there. Oh, yeah, I meant those. They're real. Yeah, really beautiful. <laughs> I says, you think so? I don't like them at all. I'm giving them back. You know, all right, at least I tried. At least I, you're always better off. Than, and if you'd say, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't look so good. How come you never like anything that I pick out? You know, either way, either way, you're meat. The only question is whether or not, you know, which, which is the safest right. But you gotta, you got to read it in its very subtle test. The most subtle test is, 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 is Shechting Yitzchak. Because God says, okay, take your son and slaughter him. 
Okay, at one level there's a test, will he do it? Because he's the father with his son. There's another test over here. God obviously doesn't mean that. He obviously means he wants to test whether or not I will read through it and say, no, God, I'm not going to shut them because you said not to kill people. You understand? There's a very subtle choice. When it comes to the furnace, obviously go into the furnace. Obviously go into the furnace. It's a, a, a idol worship versus God. There's no choice over it. It's just a little hot. That's all. Jump in. Now, there's a second reason why that's not as difficult to test. The second reason why that's not as difficult to test. He didn't have a choice. It's always easier to die as an ideologist. There are a lot of people who would like to die as ideologists. I got an ideology. And you have, as you die, you're thinking to yourself what good things people are going to say about you and write on your tombstone. Oh, he was an ideologist. Over here, you have a man who was an influential man who normally has got his act together, and all of a sudden he's packing it. Where are you going, Avram? Don't know. What are you going to be doing there? I don't know. How long are you staying there? I don't know. Why are you going? God said so. Yeah, you look like an absolute idiot. That's the test. The difficulty of the test, look what you're doing to yourself over here. Look what, what's going to happen. We'll see later on with the difficulty of the other tests. Each test has a built-in difficulty. But the test difficulty, start pack, pack your bags and go. Where? I don't know. And then you have friends that, where are you going, Avram? Don't know. What are you going to eat? Don't know. How long are you going to be there? Don't know. Yeah, that's, a, that's a really good a really good mission you're on. This is a guy who's been telling everybody else, he's been spending his life saying, hey, people, you got to have direction in your life. And now all of a sudden he comes along and he, 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 looks like an, he looks like an absolute loony. He's like one of these guys who cited a, CEO, a, a, a CEO. A CEO. <laughs> Sorry, a UFO. <laughs> Sorry, no pun intended. No, no, Freudian slip. You know, there's, there's, there, there's, a, there's a UFO. He's also way up there and does nothing. Right, yeah, a CEO in the UFO, right? They're all, they're all way overpriced. So he, he, he's, he's got, there's a UFO over there, right? Inside a UFO, where well, you guys are not. You guys are absolutely a nut. And now, Abraham Vito come. that's the difficulty of the test. That's the difficulty. Okay. Um, okay, so Abraham Avinu starts going. So he says, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. You'll be a blessing. And uh, um, and and that and he says, "Avorcham avorachecha, I'll bless those who bless you. Mekalocha, those who curse you, I will curse." V'nivruchu v'chal kol mishpachos adama. Okay, so Avram goes to Vayelech Avram kasher dibre lo v'Hashem vayelech ito lot. V'Avram ben chamesh shanim v'shev ben chamesh shanim v'shivim shana b'zayso mecharad. Avram is seventy-five when he leaves the land of Charad. Now, what we find out from this age is that if Avram is seventy-five. His father is still alive. His elderly father is still alive. Now, that begs a very big question and a very remarkable concept. What is Avram Vinu known for in the Torah? Chesed. We'll see later on. He opens his house and he has guests and he gives them each a, he gives them each a choice, choice cut of meat. He gives them each tongue. Right? You either love it or you hate it, by the way. Tongue is one of those things that it, it's not, you either love it or you hate it. Either you can't handle this the texture or you could and you love it. Right? Isn't that true, Mr. Fogel? You're a tongue man? No. Right? I, I can't touch this stuff. You know, tongue is second, to, second only to sushi in, uh, in, 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 in despisability. And, and you know, it's one of those things. It's one of those things that you either that you either love or you hate. Okay, so he serves his, he serves it. To, yeah, they, uh, don't start, don't start. I don't like sushi, and I don't like people who like sushi. So don't don't <laughs> even don't even don't even get don't even get me started. You know, don't even get me started. And I got no respect. And uh, you probably I know I can tell by the look on your face. I I I, I, can, I can see that look. I see that look. You're wondering how could anybody in the world not like sushi, right? Yeah, but well, you probably like Dr. Pepper also. So that just puts you in an absolute outside the camp category. Is it true? There you go. <laughs> they all go together. They all go together. I'm a steak, French fries, and Pepsi. That'll, that'll do it. You know, that's, that, they're, they're, right? There we go. You guys can eat the, the California weeds. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with the good old American uh, Chicago stuff. Those are also good. Yeah, those are also good, yeah. So, now, this, this is a remarkable concept, gentlemen. What's Avram Avinu known for? Chesed. Okay? What's Yitzhak known for? Gevura, which is what? Translated in English? Brave? Uh, brave? Not, not brave as much as strength, strict justice, din. Gevura. A guy who's willing to stretch his neck out on an altar better be, you know, that's Gevura, okay? What's Yaakov known for? 
emet. I don't know emet. what tiferes. I don't know what any of those things are. I only know chesed, din, and ms. That's what ms is the man of truth. Okay. Now watch this. Watch this. Avraham Avinu is a man of chesed, right? What a remarkable life he lives. First, he abandons his elderly father. Then he's going to throw his son out of the house. He's going to sell off his wife to the Egyptians. He's going to end up throwing his nephew out of the house. He's going to take. A, he's going to get involved in a world war. He's going to commit an act of self mutilation on himself and on all his family members. And he's going to take a knife to the to, to the neck of his second son. He's the Ish Chesed. Never find anybody in the Torah who is involved in as much violence as Avram Avinu. Fighting a world war. He's throwing people out of the house. He's, sta- he's, ready, to, he's ready to shecht his son. He's, he's doing a bris mila and everywhere he goes, he's got a knife. That's the Ish Chesed of the Torah. Isn't that interesting? And who's Yitzhak? Gvura. Strict justice. You picture him as the, as, the, as, as the stern headmaster of a British school where they wear uniforms. You know, where you dare not move. More? Like an Oliver. What was that? More? You know, no. And that was the, you know, that's what you picture. Yitzhak, his name means laughter. Yitzhak is the one who tolerates the wayward son. Isn't that interesting? Not like a British headmaster who throws you out, who suspends you because you yawned in class. It's like he's got a son, Asaph, and Yitzhak is the one who says, no, draw him near, let's tolerate him. Interesting. Yitzhak is the one who is forgiving to Avimelech when they steal his wells. Not what you would expect from somebody who's din. Din means uh, the letter of the law. Throw the book at him. And Yitzhak is mitzach he, he entertains his wife. What's going on here? And he's din. Interesting. What's Yaakov? Emes. You will not find anyone in Torah who's involved in more confident schemes than Yaakov. Touch him where you will, and there's a con scheme going on. He deceives his brother. He deceives his blind father. He deceives his brother again. He deceives Lavan. He deceives the people everywhere you go. Yaakov's involved in deception. And he's the man of truth. Isn't that a remarkable thing? Isn't that remarkable? No coincidence. No coincidence. And it begins with Avram Vita. First thing, Avram, go. <laughs> 75 years old. Abandon your father, your elderly father. You know what the Torah is teaching you? The Torah is teaching you that the definition of a character trait is not your nature. The definition of a character trait is going against your nature. If you're a softy, if you're a softy, that doesn't mean you're an ish chesed. A doctor who's told you have to, you have to uh, amputate some guy's foot because it's gangrene. That's, oh, I can't. I just can't. You're not an ish chesed. You're a spineless softy. You can't do it. You're not able to do it. Okay, it's not your fault. I can't do it either. I can't do it. I can't look at blood. I know, the only thing I do at home is I take out splinters. That's my job. Anything else, go to mommy. Daddy, I got my tooth done here, go to mommy. Splinters is my job because that, there's job satisfaction there. You get to squeeze a little bit, you know, use a magnifying glass, you know, put on, you know, with a, with a, with, 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 with a thing. That, you know, you, you try to pull it. Everybody knows when there's a splinter, they make my day. You know, pull out a needle, you know, it, it's a challenge. And there isn't too much blood. But, but, but a guy can't cut, you can't, you, can't, you can't remove the foot when it's gangrene. You're not a Baal Chesed, you're, you're a softy. You're spineless. That's not a Chesed. Chesed is when you're able to abandon your father because God says so. Chesed is when you can throw the kid out of the house because God said so, and he needs to be thrown out of the house. Chesed is when you have to go fight a world war for the cause of good. Chesed is dropping an atomic bomb because you're going to kill 100,000 people. Yeah, but they, that's the only way to put an end to the war. That's a Chesed. Chesed is when you're able to take a knife to your son's neck that means the chesed you're doing when you do chesed is not because you're a softy. It's because you're doing chesed because that's what God wants you to do. That's the definition of having a mita. The definition of knowing that you have a mita is that you can do the opposite when it's necessary. That's the real definition of a mita. The definition of a man who's din, you're the strict us, is that you know how to bend the din if it needs to be bent. You can tolerate a wayward son. That means you're not just by nature a stern, strict headmaster. You are a stern, strict headmaster because that's what has to be done to run a school properly. But if you ever do need to be lenient, that means now, now you're the Mita of Din because you know how to control it. And the same thing when it comes to Emes. Emes is not saying yes when it's yes and no when it's no. Emes is doing the right thing when it needs to be done. That's real Emes. 
when the guy gets married and you say to him, Kala no'ova chasuda, a wonderful, outstanding Kala you're married. You wouldn't marry her if she was the last girl in the world. No, you wouldn't marry her if she was the last girl in the world. You don't think anything good about her. But he does. And therefore, MS is to say, wow, you got yourself a real, you got yourself a good one there. A guy buys a car, and you say, how do you like my new car? You know, and you, you know what he paid for it. You know the car, and the car's not, you know. Best thing you can say, go, wow, that's great. Beautiful car. Beautiful car. Unless he's asking you because he's subject to change based on what you tell him. Then you have to tell me, you know, do you think it's a good car for the money? Should I buy it or should I, should I give it? I can still, I still, back. no, I think if you have one, I think for your money, you get a better car. But if the guy already bought it, all you're going to do is, what are you going to do? Say, yeah, my brother-in-law could have gotten it for two grand less. Great. So I'll never enjoy his car because you just told him that he overpaid by 2000 So what, That's not MS, that's Shecker. That's Shecker. You just ruined the guy. Even if what you said is objectively true. Every one of the of us, you'll see this is a, a, a theme that runs like a thread all the way through the Torah. What's Moshe Rabbeinu's trait? Humble. Humility. Moshe Rabbeinu is humility. Where's Moshe Rabbeinu? What's his role in life? <coughs> He's got to be the leader. How do you like that? Of all people running away from it, please, I have anybody but me. You're the leader. Right? That's a test of where, are you truly humble? That's why he says Moshe Rabbeinu wore a mask. He wore a mask. That means externally he showed himself as a leader. It was all a mask. Inside, it's the last thing he wanted to do. It's the last thing he wanted to do. You have later on, we'll see the story. Somebody, one of you was asking, yes sir, where's, is Benjamin here? Oh, Benjamin's not here. Remember you were asking, so we were asking about the story of, of Yehuda and Tamar. Right? So it's very interesting. You remember the story of Yehuda and Tamar? Tamar is married to Yehuda, to, 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 to Yehuda's sons. And she, then Yehuda, so she decides she wants Yibum, a form of Yibum, what we're learning about in the Gemara. She wants to marry, she wants to marry Yehuda. So what does she do? She goes out and she stands at a crossroads like a harlot. So the Gemara says, and why didn't Yehuda recognize her? Where's his former daughter-in-law? Wait, you didn't know that you didn't recognize her? I can't get know it's your daughter-in-law. The answer is because she was so tsunua when she was in his home as his daughter-in-law, she never allowed herself to be seen. Gemara says a woman who is tsunua in her father-in-law's home, she'll merit to have kings and prophets coming from her. Isn't that interesting? That's how tsunua Tamar was. She'll look like she's tsunua right now. She's standing somewhere in, 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 in Ben Yehuda Street over there, you know, attracting attention. I'm very tsunua. Well, the answer is she's at a crossroads like a harlot. The answer is that's what needed to be done right now. If it needed to be done, that means you're in control of your tzniyas. You're not somebody who's letting, who's letting the meat. Do you understand? I, the, the, the whole malchus based of it, the Davidic, the Davidic dynasty. Where does it come from? David HaMelech comes from where? Moab. It comes from Moab on one hand, and it comes from Yehuda on the other. Where does the Yehuda and Moavite line meet? Boaz and Rus. Right? Boaz marries Rus, and they have Malchus based David. That's where David Amalek comes from. Right? He's a great grandson. He's a grandson of Rus. Now, great grandson of Rus. So, so grandson or great grandson? Uh, Yishai. No, she had Ovid. She had not, not Ovid. His great great grandson. So that's where the Davidic line comes from. Now, very interesting. Boaz. How did he meet Rus? He goes out to his fields. He goes out to his fields, and there's a free for all because everybody's a leket shikapeya. They got all the produce out in the field, and Boaz says, "Well, who's that woman over there?" So Gwar says, "Boaz was the head of the Sanhedrin. What a man! He's the leader of generation. He's looking, checking out women out in the field. That's what Boaz is doing." Whereas you know why he noticed her. She was so tsunua in the way she was picking up. Everybody else is bending down and grabbing. They're hungry people. Whatever falls, you jump for. Whether somebody else is going to grab it. Ruth kind of bent down. You know, she made sure not to not to bend over in an unsneeze way. He was. She was, huh, ironically, eye-catchingly sneeze. Think about that. She was eye-catchingly sneeze. Imagine a girl at the University of Florida walking across the campus in July with a big skirt on. Right? At the University of Florida, University of Arizona, or University of anywhere in America. Right? Walking with a, with, with a full dress on the campus. She would catch more attention than any of the other uh, clothing allergy people. Right? She, she would catch all the attention. She's eye-catching Litsanua. Okay? So here's Rus, who is inherent Litsanua. How, how does she propose a marriage to Boaz? She goes down to the granary at midnight when they're all alone. In what's considered a very unsneeous manner. Why? What's the answer? What's the answer? 
She's in control of her trait. That's the sign that you have a trait. That's what the Torah begins with. The Torah begins with, with an Avram Avinu who's in absolute control of his chesed. God says, go. What about my elderly father? God said, go. Therefore, I have to go. That's the test of having the meeting. Okay, tomorrow we'll continue with the next test. Mm-hmm.